What up, what up, Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Hope that you've been listening to some of my other episodes that are out there and you've been enjoying them uh, when it comes to raising money successfully with a crowdfunding campaign. And then also, you are having an incredible day wherever you are hailing in. If you were listening to this in the car on the way to work, listen to this over a delicious cup of coffee. I hope that you are going to take away some incredible advice, tips, tactics, and resources from today's podcast episode. We actually got into how this individual raised over $1.7 million with an equity crowdfunding campaign. Uh, before I get into that, you know, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate and freaking, you know, inspired to share this message with you is that sometimes the only thing that's holding you back is getting access to the right quality information. Uh, for a quick story, you know, my dad is uh, one of the people who inspired me in my life because he was always someone that was inventing and creating new products and new things. And the kind of downside, though, was that he would never actually bring a uh, one of his inventions or commercialize it in any kind of way. So we had these incredible ideas, these amazing products, which he was making all the time, but he never actually brought them to market. And the one time that he did, he did this under a company. So uh, a company that I was working with, and I won't name the name, but a company that I was working with, he actually brought one of these inventions to market. And lo and behold, it made this company millions of dollars in revenue because of this invention that he had. And when I saw that, man, the cool thing about that is that the ideas that you have in your head can actually not only be turned into real world products that can impact other people's lives, but also be responsible for delivering thousands, if not millions of dollars in revenue for a company which grows years into the future and impacts your legacy. Now, unfortunately, this is something that you have to be willing to control. You have to be willing to step up and bring to market. And I think that in, in hearing that story and really seeing that and witnessing that for myself, you know, the saddest part is that uh, another company was able to, you know, commercialize this intellectual property uh, instead of my dad. And when I saw that, I realized, you know what, I want to get this resources and tools for anyone to be able to do this, to reach their full potential, to bring new product ideas into the world. I want to get this out there because the world is missing that high quality education and training so that anyone can raise money, so that anyone can create a business, so that anyone can bring a new product into the world. So in today's podcast episode, we are going to discover how this individual was able to raise over $1.7 million with an equity crowdfunding campaign, the tactics, the tools, the resources, the strategy that went into that powerful raise. And you're going to really understand at the end of this episode what you got to do if you are also in the trenches and as well, an incredible investment opportunity for those of you that are interested in getting into the ground floor of the next big thing when it comes to apps like TikTok, except this is completely gamified and really, really cool. The one thing resource I'm going to mention before we get into today's podcast is that I have a great book out there if you are interested in learning more about equity crowdfunding and how to raise money and launch a powerful equity crowdfunding campaign. This book gives you the entire foundation as to how to do that, as well as all the marketing, the strategy, um, the things that go into this in order to actually not only hit your goal, but also exceed it and make sure that you don't fall flat with your campaign. So I have a, a great resource out there. You can go check this out at uh, crowdcrux.com slash equity audio. This link will take you to my book, Equity Crowdfunding Explained, which is available on Audible. So that link is crowdcrux.com slash equity audio. That's crowdcrux, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash equity audio. Without further ado, let's dive into today's podcast episode and discover how this entrepreneur, this individual was able to raise over $1.7 million with an equity crowdfunding campaign. And it's coming up right after this. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Hey, we're speaking with an incredible team that has raised over a million dollars on WeFunder. Uh, for a really cool business overplay that allows you to turn any video into a game. And we'll be talking more about that in just a second. And we are lucky enough to have a member of the co-founding team here today. Caroline, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Um, so maybe we can get started. You can just tell the listeners a bit more about the business, more about the product, and we can start there. Sure. So overplay in a nutshell, is a light layer of gaming that sits on top of streaming video. And on the player side, it's almost like TikTok for gaming. So you're having, you're playing snackable games made by millions of people around the world on every topic. Um, and they're 30 to 45 second games that you're 
just scrolling through just like TikTok and you're able to play them. And, uh, you know, by tapping and swiping or rolling your phone. So it's a, it's a really, really cool experience. And there are games made by anyone. On the creator side, it's a no-code solution for turning any video into a game. And you literally just play your games into existence. And wow. so it's a patented platform. And we're super excited to bring it out into the world. That's so cool. I mean, this sounds like crack cocaine, honestly. <laughs> like, this sounds awesome. Um, very engaging and the ability to kind of scroll through different ones as well. Like sounds mm -hmm. pretty cool. Uh, so, so what is your, your role at the company? Sure. So I'm the co-founder and COO of Overplay. I'm currently in charge of fundraising, of course. Um, it is like a full-time job, uh, but I'm also doing partnerships, um, high-level strategy, uh, and also digging in, testing games. As a founder, you wear many hats of course so uh yeah hiring <laughs> that's <laughs> a great day, job testing yeah. games yeah right? that's, yeah, that's <laughs> yep. great yep um how long have you guys been in operation here? how long have you been uh working on this now yeah so we kind of count our start really around 2021 because we raised our first round of funding in 2021 our pre-seed round and we were really able to take the product from an MVP to an alpha with that first round of funding and bring, and then, you know, kind of bring that alpha out. So we see 2021 as kind of like our, our um, yeah, our launch, not to the public, but uh, to kind of make the idea really kind of a more playable experience. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we raised a million and a half in 2021 on a safe. And that was mostly through institutional and angel investors, as well as friends and family. Mm -hmm. And that round was not a uh, community round. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. a crowdfunding. Yeah. Got it. And, and when it comes to you, what were you doing before you really um, brought this into your life and, you know, made this your your full soul or your uh, soul focus. What were you doing before that? Sure. So I actually met my co-founder Dan at Sesame Street. I used hey. to run. <laughs> I used to run digital media business development at Sesame, and Dan ran interactive production. So we made all sorts of really cool kids product together: um, AR and VR uh, product with Qualcomm and Intel. Uh, Sesame's very first apps. We did rapid prototyping with IDEO, uh, console gaming with uh, for Xbox. We actually created Sesame Street Connect TV, which was the Xbox uh, controller where where Xbox scanned your body and made your body the controller, which was really kind of cool for kids now being able to jump into TV shows and have interactive experiences. So we did all sorts of cool stuff together, Dan and I. Uh, we worked together for seven years at Sesame. And then I went over to Scholastic Media, where I did similar kinds of things. So um, interactive product. But then I also worked on the uh, Goosebumps movie with Jack Black and the original Magic School Bus series that's currently on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I So the Magic School Bus rides again. So I have this me background in media and entertainment. I used to be an investment banker back in the day. And I'm also just an entrepreneur. I had also created a direct-to-consumer flower company with my sister. And so, um, yeah, I'm kind of like a consummate entrepreneur, but I have also a background in banking and media. Wow. I mean, you've been successful in a lot of different verticals, it sounds like, right? <laughs> but it's all useful. It all comes full circle. Like if I wasn't a banker, I just, I don't know that I'd be able to fundraise as well for my current startup, or if I hadn't done business development uh, or worked in interactive, it, it, I just feel like it's all been building to this point, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the different pieces of the story only make sense when you're kind of looking back on them, right? Uh, and kind of like connecting the dots in that way. So yeah, I can totally see that. That's the way life is in a way. It's a little bit weird because it's, it's one of these things where you have to keep yourself open to new opportunities. And then like in retrospect, you look back and you're like, Oh wow, that was really helpful for what I'm doing now. Like, because if, mm. if you would have said, Oh, you know, being a banker, how is it helpful for, you know, doing a startup or doing crowdfunding? I'm like, Oh my God, it's 
so helpful. <laughs> it's I, like, it's everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can imagine just the, the knowledge is, is extremely helpful, but also your network, right? Um, I, I assume that's something that played a really pivotal role, right? In this campaign and also in your, your prior races. Yeah. I would say that to be frank with you, um, it's, it wasn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the banking network that has been helpful with my crowdfunding. Um, because I frankly haven't had a lot of my banker friends, uh, actually, um, actually, uh, invest yet. Um, what? Gotta get but, on that. um where yeah. I will say it's really helpful is in the language. Um, so it's the vernacular that a lot of, cause a lot of investors are former bankers. So a lot of VCs are former bankers. Mm. And so just being able to come to the table, and sit across from them on an equal level because I was a banker, mm -hmm. I can kind of speak the language and kind of think the way that they do. And yeah. so that's been really helpful, like strategically, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine, um, you know, and going from like raising from an institutional or from friends and family to then having like 600 people around the world that have invested in this. Like, how does that happen? Um, are these people that are discovering you on WeFund or is this from your own marketing outreach? Like, how are these people discovering you? Yeah, there's a lot of different pieces to this. So uh, equity crowdfunding, it's it's a really fantastic concept. And I'm so glad that we're able to do this here in the United States. I know um, other places where there's founders, it's not, they're not as lucky to be able to have this opportunity. Um, but thank God we have laws that where we can actually, that actually mm -hmm. are, are helpful to startup founders. So one of the things that we did, of course, we mine our network. And I from the beginning, I always knew that my network would be my strength. Um, one of my strengths in, uh, in, in just in life. Um, and so I always tossed everyone into LinkedIn. Everyone that I met, uh, you know, almost like on a daily basis, I kind of think through folks that I had e emailed with or maybe had drinks with or whatever, and I tossed them into my LinkedIn. So my LinkedIn is my Rolodex. And that was originally one of the first things that we mined from uh, my Rolodex and my co-founders Rolodex, um, my, our LinkedIn basically. And we had our initial outreach through that. And then also on LinkedIn, just establishing yourself on LinkedIn as a decent person, you know, with, you have a decent photo, people see who you are and what you've done in the past. And if you do cold outreach on LinkedIn, they're mo more likely to link up with you and then mm. also respond to your <laughs> cold outreach. And so that was another way too that we got our initial funding in. So it was friends and family, yes, people who we know, who know us and love us and who believed in us. But then it was a lot of cold outreach on my part through LinkedIn. Um, but that was also after they saw that I was a legit person, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah. and we had conversations and such. So, yeah. When you're doing that kind of outreach, like, are you just going straight for the jugular and being like, hey, I got a campaign, like, go invest in it? Or are you like building a relationship before you do that? Like, what is that communication channel like or that conversation like? Yeah, no, it's, I, I don't go for the jugular. <laughs> I uh, do a light touch. So um, I, you know, I, I actually use the free version of LinkedIn and, uh, you can connect with somebody and you want to make your messaging to them. You know, you have only a certain amount of um, characters or you know, yeah. a certain amount of characters that you're able to use. It ends up to be like three or four sentences only. So you have to be very succinct and you have to be, you have to say something compelling to them. Um, but at the end, you know, I kind of just, I tell them a little bit about what I'm doing. And then I say, mind if we connect and mm. then the ball's in their court. And if they want to connect with me, they'll say yes. And then they'll, and then I'll write to them and I'll say, Hey, thanks for connecting with me. You know, here's what we're doing. You know, mind if I send you our deck, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, or if not, I send them to the WeFunder page or whatever it is that it might be. But it's only after that, after they connect with me that I kind of give them a little bit more detail. And then I still put the ball in their court. I don't want them. I don't want to spam them. I don't want them to feel like I'm, uh, you know, I, I don't want them. I don't want to ask for a meeting. I, you know, I'm like, is it okay if I send you our deck? You know, it's really, 
they have to think that what we're doing is compelling. And that's mm-hmm. also why it's very important to have a web page or a WeFunder page that really that really gets people excited. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's so incredibly important because that's really your perception, right? At the end of the day. Um, and, and when you're having that conversation, I guess a lot of people would be like, well, then like, do people just invest then or do I do a call with them or like, do you do, you do any kind of phone calls or anything like that for, with people? Yeah. <laughs> when you're raising on a WeFunder, you absolutely have to be open to doing phone calls. And, you know, sometimes the phone call results in a thousand dollar investment, but sometimes it, you know, evolves into a hundred and twenty five thousand dollar investment. You know, and mm-hmm. so, and then also to once you have the phone calls with folks, and you can actually show them the product because also this is a whole thing with overplay. It's a brand new form of technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's one of those things where it's kind of like you got to see it to believe it. And so I love hopping on Zoom calls and showing people what we've built, and their eyes kind of pop out of their head. And it kind of gives you that validation as well, that what, something that you built could be valuable to these people. And so, you know, having those phone calls and those connections, they feel, you know, really loved, frankly, as an investor, and they see the value that they could bring to the table for you. And then a lot of them also then start introducing their friends to me. And mm. so sometimes a phone call might end up you know, it it might end up being three other phone calls with their friends that they're recommending. So this is all worthwhile, but it is an investment that you actually have to make in terms of time for when you do an equity crowdfunding raise. If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight, and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is f u l f i l l r i t e dot com slash checklist. Fulfillright dot com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. And and just looking at what other people are saying, like I'm just scrolling through some of these comments. Some people saying that they ha- you have a great idea in vision. You have other people saying they love the concept. Um, one person says they had a friend of theirs told them about the overplay and they love it. Other people say gaming is big and they like it. So it seems like people are kind of uh, resonating across the board. Um, even other people that are investing in uh, woman-led startups, right? Yeah, the cool thing about it is that I know those... Um... Those remarks were made just recently, actually, over the last couple of days. And I actually have never met either of those two people that made those remarks. So they're getting that just from the WeFunder page. You know, somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And and so that's why that page has to be, it really does have to speak for what you're building, what that brand is. We invested a lot of money in making a video for that page. Actually, we have Mm -hmm. a few videos on that page. We have testimonials. And then we're also updating that page pretty regularly. And we're posting uh, for on the WeFunder page. There's you can post updates. We're posting like twice a week now with those updates. Yeah. And I think that can be uh, a great way to build relationship and also just kind of build a little bit of brand. And also people know like who's behind this thing, right? Oh, yeah. And I mean, Dan and I are real people. <laughs> <laughs> we're, you know, I we mean, you are, seem a bit superhuman, but I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we're trying really hard. We built something really awesome that we wanted to bring to the world. And we, we frankly also, from the beginning, Dan and I always knew that we wanted to create a creator first platform. And we wanted the creators to share. It, to be to be owners in overplay and to share in our wealth and what we feel will be a huge exit for us one day. And we want to create us to be a part of it. So from the beginning, we always talked about carving out like a million dollars of our round to raise as a we funder. And we wanted creators to be a part of this journey with us. So that was actually one of the reasons why we decided to do the we funder. And a lot of investors, 
through our WeFunder had never invested in a company before. And really? so they're, they're, very, they're first time angel investors. And we feel so, so good about that. Uh huh. Uh huh. I mean, that that's a huge testament, I think, to what you're doing, and the fact as well that it's really upgrading in the space, even you know, just the way you play games. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the one of the other questions I'm going to have on on kind of that front. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the like, gaming and entertainment. Like at the end of the day, what would you say is like the vision for the company? Is it to entertain people, or is it something larger than that? Something larger than that. Um, we really see overplay as democratizing gaming. Now anyone can make games. They can consider themselves a game maker. And it's kind of, it, it's, it's, this is a brand new concept where if you can shoot a video, now you can make it interactive without having any knowledge of coding or being an engineer or anything like this. And you can do it in minutes. So to make a half minute video, it will take you maybe five minutes to do. And, or it's, I'm sorry, to make a half minute game, it'll t maybe take you five minutes to do. And so that's one of those things where we really feel like we're changing the landscape around how games are made, who can make games, and who can consider themselves a game maker. We're putting tools into everyone's hands to be able to make stuff interactive. And um, and this is just the beginning. We actually have huge, huge plans Um because our patent actually is is pretty broad and does give us a lot of um, license to roll out a, a, a number of other cool ideas um, mm. and and uh, but yeah it's it's any anybody can now make a game so we're talking about you know people who are filming their 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 kids or their dog or whatever doing something at home you know running around the backyard or it could be movie studios or it could be the NBA you know, content that is currently being filmed, like for something that's happening right now could be mm -hmm. made into a game right now. And so now games will be current and they'll be, you know, disposable if they, you know, if you need, if it's only relevant for today, then that's absolutely fine as well. Mm -hmm. But now games are, you know, the cost of making a game has been brought down to zero basically. And it's really only somebody's time in being able to, put the inputs on top of a video now to make a game. It's also something where, you know, apps in this space, whether that's TikTok or like reels or, you know, threads, like they get big so fast. Mm -hmm. right? It's just like, it's astounding nowadays how that works. Um, I remember in the early days, like having just the flip phone, right? Like the razor phone. <laughs> now it's like, it's completely different level. Um, so I could totally see the market size for this is, is huge, right? The potential there. Yeah, everyone is taking video right now. So imagine taking any of that video and making it interactive. And it could really even be the most boring video. You could have a video of a ceiling fan <laughs> moving, and you could actually make that a really fun game by putting interactive animations and overlays on top of it and really cool sound effects. And it could be a really, actually a really cool, fun game. Um, and uh, and so it's it's now letting people's creativity almost run wild in an mm. interactive way. Yeah. Love it. Uh, one of the other things that you mentioned in our pre-show was about this idea of working with other campaigns and other companies, right? Um, and kind of either doing that organically or sharing. I just was wondering if you could kind of shed some light on what you were referring to there. Sure. So there are some companies, as you look across other folks who are doing crowdfunding raises, and sometimes you look at a company and you're like, oh, okay, they kind of, you know, it makes sense for us to potentially work with them on something and then maybe doing a list share. So folks who invested in them might also want to invest in me. Uh, one of the companies that we did this with is a company called Rad AI, which is a really cool um, AI intelligence tool for marketing. And they were doing a crowdfunding on WeFunder as well. And mm -hmm. we were told about them and we looked at what they were doing and we're like, wow, we could actually use their technology to help inform us as to what sample games could be made on our private beta that we have right now. And so we reached out to Rad AI and we told them a little bit about what we did and they loved us. And um, then basically they, through their um, intelligent listening online through AI, they were able to tell us that they're like, well, you know, people would love to see a pickleball game. 
And so we're like, you know what, let's go ahead and make a pickleball game for overplay. And so we were able to do that within, you know, a day and Mm -hmm. then push this pickleball game out into the world. And we did this in collaboration with Rad AI. We made some noise about it on our WeFunder page. They made some noise about it with their investors. And frankly, we have we've had over a hundred thousand dollars of investment come in from that. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> from that wow. List. Yeah. That was a well day. That was a day well spent right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. It was not, it was great peanuts. though. It was it was very organic though. And we're gonna be doing a lot more with Rad AI, not just with the crowdfunding, but also frankly, strategically with overplay. Yeah, yeah, really cool. And good good tip as well, this idea of collaborating with other people is an opportunity. Um, you know, one other question I have kind of on the founder front, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people listening to this show are going to hear from you, you know, being a Wharton MBA, being a two-time founder, having investment banking background, being able to do digital marketing and entertainment. And you almost seem kind of like a little bit untouchable uh, to put the word on it. You know, for a beginner, for someone who's like a, a normal founder, do you feel like this is something that's possible that they could put their idea out there with a business? Uh, maybe it's already has some traction. And they could they could raise funding. Do you think you're an outlier here, or do you feel like other people could use this tool? Oh, other people can totally use this. And <laughs> yeah, I um, yeah, I know my my re- my background is a little. <laughs> Um, it might feel a little bit superhuman, but I'm not, I just, I'm a person that tries really, really hard. I'm just going to put that out there. (laughs) Everything that, you know, all of these pieces, this is all a lot of hard work and yes, it all does culminate into something like this, but anybody can do this. Um, and also, you know, we also knew where we were a little bit deficient, right? So we actually are working with a marketing company who is helping us specifically with the raise because as we're building overplay and doing the institutional raise at the same time and the crowdfunding raise, and you know, we're, we have a team of 14 people, but we have no you know, marketing communications folks on the inside or anything like that. And so we actually needed to hire an external firm who specializes in equity crowdfunding because we wanted to hit this out of the park. And it was really their insight that helped us to create a kick-ass page and also helped us have these ideas around list sharing, mining our network, using sales tools, all sorts of things like this. So I am very thankful that we brought them on board because frankly, we probably wouldn't have had the bandwidth um, to do something like this, or if not, we would have been. <laughs> yeah, we would have been checked into a loony farm. Like, yeah, <laughs> a while ago, it, we did need this extra support for, uh, like I said, we you know we had this vision that equity crowdfunding would work really well for overplay, and we made the decision that we would need the help from the beginning to make it successful. Yeah, I, I think that's really smart. And um, one of the things that I've I've learned or that I'm taking away here, I think, from your career is that you've been very mindful about who you partner with and who you surround yourself with and filling in those gaps of your skill set, I think is, is really the way to to have that kind of superhuman success, right. That we talk about. Yeah. It's um, it's, it's very important how you spend your time and also what you focus on strategically. And uh, yeah, it's um, and you, you know, it's, it's very interesting as an entrepreneur, you see, who supports you in your life and who doesn't support you. It it kind of comes out in the wash. I mean, you'll have friends or relationships that once you start a company, sometimes Mm -hmm. those relationships go away. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes very surprising, but most entrepreneurs that I've spoken with have this experience, like folks who they've been friends with for many, many years start kind of going away because they don't necessarily support you on your journey. They don't think that you should necessarily be doing something like this with your life Mm. Um, or they're even maybe risk averse themselves. And so you as an entrepreneur is a little bit of a scary thing. It's even scary for them to be friends with you Mm -hmm. because, you know, you start talking about your experience or, or the struggles that you might be having or the successes that you're having and somehow it rubs them the wrong way and they don't want to be in your company. And mm. it's a it's a very weird thing as an entrepreneur. It's kind of 
it does kind of screw with your brain a little bit, but then you realize that your true friends or the people who do stand by you in your journey, those are the folks that you do want in your life. And they will, even if your startup would fail, that they'll still be beside you, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's, it is a life lesson. There are some very hard life lessons that you learn as an entrepreneur that you might not, if you did not go this route. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I appreciate yeah. you being transparent in that way. And I think that a lot of people will, will connect with that point. And I think it's kind of like being in the special forces, you know, it's almost like something that's so different than um, the normal kind of routine, the way of going to work or just the mentality and the mindset that, it, you know, it's not for everyone. And you kind of do in some ways um, then resonate more with people that are also right in the special forces and not everyone supports you right in that decision. Yeah. I will say another thing too, is that having, I have a lot of entrepreneur friends now and thank God for them because we're able to get together and just, you know, talk about everything that we're going through and they understand because Mm -hmm. if you're talking to normal people who have a regular job and you might be talking about these investor conversations or whatever it is that it might be, they don't quite understand or the struggle that you feel, um, you know, uh, it, it's a very, very tough thing waking up every morning and being an entrepreneur. You're responsible for everything and mm-hmm. you have a huge uh, burden on your shoulders. And it's sometimes like, and only other entrepreneurs actually understand that. Yeah. And I think to be willing to endure that and to accept that and to move forward, that's what kind of gives you that badge of honor, right? Of like, wow, I've actually impacted the world, right? I've actually done something that is good for other people, which is which is quite rewarding, I can imagine. Yeah. And and that's why what you've read out on our posts on, on our WeFunder page, these posts that other people have made about us, it's such a nice shot in the arm for the entrepreneur because sometimes you really do feel alone in your journey, but then you realize you're like, oh my gosh, people actually do love our product and look mm-hmm. at what they're saying about us and look at how much they believe in us. And you're like, oh, I'm not alone in this. There's 600 some other people who have invested in me right now behind me because they actually do believe in me. And that mm-hmm. feels really good. You're building that army, building that <laughs> army. Um, well, this is awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing some advice and tips. Where can people go to learn more about your current campaign? And also, where can they go to learn more about the, the company here? Sure. So come over to wefunder.com slash overplay and check us out there. We're constantly updating. You could also go on overplay.com and also um, follow us on LinkedIn. So we have a really cool LinkedIn page for overplay that um, we're constantly updating as well. And uh, like I said, that that's that's where my network is. And you can, you know, ping me on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm happy to be friends with you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I'll be sure to include those uh, links in the description. And my final question for you, and we can end on this note, uh, we can either end with a quote that you like, that you've maybe heard, or someone has told you, a book that you recommend other people should read, or um, a word of encouragement for other people out there that are pursuing their dreams and that are trying to uh, make a dent in the universe. Any of those, and we can end on that note. So my quote currently that's on my WhatsApp <laughs> status is just go. And I really do mean it. I I mean this in everything in life. If you feel like you should be doing something, just go, do it. You know, and 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 make your way forward on a daily basis. Just go for it, and um, and make what you think you should be doing with your life. Make it happen. Well said, Caroline. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Good luck with your remaining days here. And uh, looking forward to seeing your more and more of your app and your success in the future. Thanks so much, Salvador. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman, and man, oh man, was this not one of the best episodes which we produced on this show? I can't just tell you the number of incredibly valuable tips and lessons that I took away from this episode when it comes to equity crowdfunding and raising investment capital from the crowd. 
So uh, I think we are so privileged to have had this guest on the show. And if you also believe that to be the case, definitely go and check out their campaign, but also leave us a positive rating and review uh, on this show. Let us know which episodes you like so we can produce more like that. Would mean so much to me if you left a positive rating and review on iTunes. Um, in addition, for those of you who really want to understand more of what goes into a crowdfunding campaign, I do have that great book out there, Equity Crowdfunding Explained, which is available on Amazon, Audible, and also via ebook uh, and paperback version. You can check that out on Amazon or on Audible. But uh, in addition, you know, I think that one of the big things that goes into this campaign is just knowing what you got to do every step of the way. And I would say that it's a little bit more complicated doing an equity crowdfunding campaign than doing a simple Kickstarter or an Indiegogo campaign where you just kind of pre selling the product. So if you really want expert guidance going into this project, if you want to have a trained eye, look over your project and your strategy and your marketing um, and everything that goes into the actual marketing of the campaign, your game plan. If you want to go through that, we can book an intensive coaching call or coaching session. And not only can I go over that, but it can also draw from this massive war chest that I have in my head of techniques, tools, and resources that are proven to work when it comes to driving funding, driving investors, driving traction to an equity crowdfunding campaign, be that on WeFunder, Start Engine, Republic. Um, there's so many different big platforms out there nowadays when it comes to doing one of these projects, or if you're even uncertain if you should be doing one of these campaigns with your business, or if you're uncertain of which platform to launch on, we can talk about that in an intensive coaching session. So all you got to do to actually book one of those sessions is to go to the link I'm about to mention, fill out a little bit of information, tell me more about you, what you're trying to do, how much you're trying to raise, and we can get that call scheduled ASAP. Just go to the link at crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching, crowdcrux.com slash coaching. We'll take you there and you can book your intensive coaching call with me and get that squared away ASAP. And I also do have as well uh, many students in the equity crowdfunding arena who are interested in maybe even getting some help with execution, uh, whether that's with me or my digital marketing team. We can talk more about that if you want to at the end of the session, but they're designed to be useful, strategic, helpful, and tactical. So that way you walk away from that session with more confidence and you know exactly what you got to do when it comes to your equity crowdfunding game plan to raise investment capital from the crowd and give this opportunity to people all over the world. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Salvador Brigman. Stay tuned for our episode next week and uh, looking forward to that one. It's going to be a killer episode. I say that, but um, I'm telling you, man, next episode is going to be great. You definitely want to tune in. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time. <music>